we'll be discussing leadership in a sustainability journey. Moderating is Ms. Nyo Gim Hoi, Managing Director, Climate Change Strategy, Tomasek International. Welcome to the Tomasic Shop House Conversations. Today, our topic is on leadership. Leadership in sustainability, leadership for climate action. And the issue of sustainability and climate change is dear to many of us. I mean, the video that you've seen is, uh, the images are, are, are not new to many of us. Whoever we are, wherever we may be, we are experiencing and will continually be impacted by climate change. But I also like to see this as one of the best opportunities to bring humanity together, to bridge across generations, and to forge a sense of collective purpose and action. And in moments such as this, we also find good leaders emerge, people with conviction, courage, and perhaps even charisma to inspire and mobilize action. I am hence delighted that we have today six very important persons who have graciously accepted our invitation to join the conversations. Global leaders who are shaping and driving sustainability and the climate agenda in their various arenas. So the six panelists come from very diverse backgrounds, policy and politics, business, as well as the NGO and academic sectors. They are also located in key geographies. We have representatives based in the US, EU, China, India, and ASEAN. These geographies are critical to whether we can rise up to the challenge and address the climate crisis. So I'm delighted to be able to bring all of us together to have conversations tonight. I would now like to invite the panel to share their leadership reflections in the sustainability journey. What is your dream? What is your vision? How do we get there? What are the developments that you are driving or seeing? What more do we need to collectively realize a sustainable future? And first on the panel, we have Dr. Amy Kaur, uh, Singapore Senior Minister of State for Sustainability and the Environment. Dr. Kaur has also been a member of parliament uh, for 20 years. Uh, she's one of the most energetic and popular MPs I know, working very closely with community groups uh, to serve their needs and their interests. Dr. Ko, could you tell us a little bit more about the Green Plan? Uh, Minister has shared some of the uh, initiatives. What do you think are the key challenges? Where are the milestones? And what will success look like? Dr. Ko? Thank you very much. Thank you, Game Wei, for the very kind remarks. Your Excellency Professor In Balkananda, Your Excellency Mr. Sarono Kusuma Maja, fellow panelists and distinguished participants, a very good evening to one and all. The urgency to enhance climate action and sustainable development indeed has grown in recent years. Environmental catastrophes, as you have seen in the video, have become more frequent such as the recent floods in Indonesia, East Timor, and Australia. The COVID-19 pandemic has also disrupted many lives and livelihoods, increased social economic inequalities, and actually increased waste generation. Fortunately, building back better 
has become a mantra. The European Union has announced plans to rebuild a post-COVID Europe that will be greener, more digital, more resilient. China has also committed to reducing carbon emissions by 65% from 2005 levels and to work closely with their partners on a green belt and road. And in two weeks, 40 world leaders, including our Prime Minister Li, will participate in the Leaders' Summit on Climate hosted by US President Joseph Biden. At the same time, communities and companies are taking more effort to place sustainability at the core of the COVID-19 recovery. Please allow me to share three aspects of climate leadership that cut across the three P sectors with regards to commitment, courage, and collaboration, since we are talking about leadership in climate uh, action. First, commitment. Climate change and sustainable development are long-term challenges that require long-term solutions. As a multi-generational endeavor, we need to be committed to achieving our climate and environmental goals and bring ideas and resources to bear. Singapore recently launched our Singapore Green Plan, as Kim Wei had said earlier. The plan sets out ambitious and concrete targets to advance Singapore's national agenda on sustainable development and strengthen our commitments under the UN Sustainable Development Agenda and the Paris Agreement. Singapore submitted our Enhanced 2030 Nationally Determined Contribution, or NDC, and our Long-Term Low Emissions Development Strategy, or LEDS, in March 2020. We made both these commitments despite the pandemic because we recognize that more than ever, sustainability needs to be at the core of our development. Businesses are also starting to demonstrate more commitment to sustainability. And for instance, to Masse at the headquarters level achieved carbon neutrality last year and is pursuing plans to achieve a net zero carbon portfolio by 2050. The MAS has also initiatives to broaden green financing. Companies will gain access to sustainability linked bonds and loans, green funds and asset managers, as well as insurance linked securities to finance projects and strengthen climate risk resilience. Beyond governments and businesses, climate action must be a whole of nation effort. Next is courage. Operating in a carbon and resource constrained world requires taking hard decisions. While technology and innovation can help us to mitigate the cost of climate mitigation and adaptation, trade-offs are often necessary. And in 2019, Singapore introduced a carbon tax. That decision was not easy, due to the potential impact on our economic competitiveness. But we wanted to internalize this cost of carbon and to incentivize emissions reductions across all sectors and transit to a low carbon economy. So we have not exempted any industry from the tax to maintain a transparent, fair and consistent price signal. And to further promote industry innovation and green growth, we are reviewing this trajectory and the level of carbon tax post-2023, which we will share in budget 2022. Courage will also be required to deliver substantive outcomes at the 26th COP meeting in Glasgow this year in November. We hope that the parties will be able to finalize the rules of implementing carbon markets, firm up the transparency framework formats and reporting requirements, and also develop a new collective goal for climate finance. Corporate leaders will undoubtedly face similar challenges in pivoting their business models towards decarbonization and sustainable production. Finally, leadership in sustainability requires collaboration because we can learn from and contribute to each other. Governments all over have climate change and sustainability action plans, which include whole of nation efforts. For instance, Indonesia has recently announced Vision Indonesia 2045, which prioritizes circular economy for green growth. And Malaysia has its Green Technology Master Plan 2030, which focuses on low carbon development. Brunei also recently launched its national climate change policy. So we must deepen collaboration and create new opportunities to exchange information and experiences. 
At the regional level, ASEAN has also enhanced our cooperation among ourselves and dialogue partners because opportunities and challenges can have multiplier effect in each country and also within the region. ASEAN chairmen have in recent years made sustainability part of their chairmanships. Singapore, for instance, has launched a three-year climate action package to support our ASEAN neighbours and other developing countries to build capacity in climate science and long-term climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. But of course, more can be done. We should deepen existing exchanges and create new opportunities to exchange information and experiences within ASEAN and with our dialogue partners in tackling common environmental issues. And this will further shorten our learning and implementation curves. So I want to encourage our leaders to participate in platforms such as this, which bring together people, ideas, and partnerships to find solutions. Before concluding, please let me say a few words about Park Sawono. Park Sawono's illustrious career and many contributions have exemplified commitment, courage, and collaboration, the three Cs I was talking about. Through his friendship and close cooperation with various Singapore leaders, such as SM Teo Chi Hien, Singapore and Indonesia worked to tackle challenges and embark on mutually beneficial cooperation. And in retirement, he has remained active on climate change and environmental issues as a trusted advisor to Minister Siti Nabaya. I join Minister Desmond Lee to thank Park Saono for his contributions and congratulate him on his memoir. And indeed, Singapore looks forward to building on the strong bilateral foundation with Park Saono, who has helped us to lay and expand cooperation with Indonesia in areas such as circular economy, waste management, and climate change. Finally, let me thank to Masik Foundation for organizing this event and to commend to Masik for the Shop House Conversation Series. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I hear many Cs, uh, commitment, courage, collaboration to address the 2C problem, climate crisis. Um, without further ado, let me now invite Park Sawano. Uh, he's currently Chairman of the Advisory Board for Climate Change Policies in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry in Indonesia. A uh, very long record of social activism as well as political engagement across many issues. And, uh, and for those who have not read his book, uh, and I did read it over one weekend, uh, I would highly encourage it. Uh, it's called Clearing a Middle, a middle And um, Pak Sawono, on climate change, can you tell us more about how Indonesia is thinking about its policies? And like the title of your book, is there a middle course or a middle path where we can walk for economic development uh, for the people and also environment conservation? Absolutely, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, thank you to Minister Desmond Lee and Minister Amikor for their kind words directed to me. I'm really uh, touched by their regard of myself. And I'd like to state that uh, the time we have on our hands is a precious moment to harvest, consolidate, and to act on ideas uh, generated uh, during this meeting. Now, uh, whether there is middle course in climate change, I'm, I'm inclined to think that there isn't. Yeah? We have no choice but to combat climate change. So there is only one danger zone, indifference to climate change. Or to quote uh, Professor Gustav Spath, there are three problems that are very difficult to solve in climate change. The first is greed, the second is ignorance, and the third is apathy. So we are up against these things, and we have no choice, no recourse, but to face these threats directly and successfully. Now, um, uh, tonight, uh, I'm inclined to listen to all the 
other distinguished panelists, and also to expect um, uh, contributions as well from the floor. And uh, with this note, I think uh, I can say that the Indonesian government is committed yeah, to do its part, but it needs assistance. It needs to nurture growth at the lowest level of the society. Since uh, I've seen it myself, that the change agents for the future would be at the grassroots level. And the government has no other choice but to facilitate and to make life easier for their people. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pak. Yes, indeed, uh, community action, uh, grassroots, uh, will be very critical uh, for us to uh, drive collective action. Uh, Prof. Yen Peter, you're next. <laughs> uh, Prof. Yen Peter has a very interesting background, uh, having been an academic, a politician, as well as also being very active in the corporate world. Uh, other than being the former Prime Minister of the Netherlands, I know that you're also a professor of Christian theology. Uh, and right now you chair the Dutch uh, Sustainable Growth Coalition. Uh, this comprises the largest global companies, uh, many famous names that we know of, Unilever, Philips, Shell, KLM, Heineken. Uh, so you're very much uh, involved uh, in how they're thinking about sustainability issues. And Prof. Yen Peter, could you tell us more about your reflections? on the confluence between governments, markets, society. I know you were one of the first to point the term moral capitalism. Can sustainability be profitable? And what is the experience of the EU? Prof. Yes. Neil, Neil, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Um, Your Excellencies, uh, Minister Lee, Mr. Korm, uh, Mr. Savono, uh, Dr. Steer, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I want to thank Tomasek for organizing this discussion on climate action. It's a key issue for our future. And climate action is a part of a broader global agenda. It's about the sustainable development goals, climate change, the circular economy, and combating inequality. It's a very inspiring agenda that can unite countries, people, businesses, governments, NGOs. It's a source of inspiration. And if you're convinced that it's necessary to realize them, then you need concrete actions and measurements. This is really key. We have enough statements, commitments. Uh, the question is, how can we realize them? I think this is the key issue of today. And the longer we wait, the higher the price will be in the future. And if you talk about climate action, it's good to be specific. And that's, I think, the goal of Tomasek. Well, now about the latest climate action developments in the Netherlands and, and Europe. First, my own country, the Netherlands. We just had elections, so we wait for the new government and the policy proposals. But besides that, you can see there are clear commitments. The Netherlands has said uh, in 2030, we should reduce the CO2 emissions by 49%, and I expect this will be a bit higher. We have to do much more in the sphere of the renewables uh, regarding energy. We will have a 100% uh, a carbon uh, free economy, a uh, circular economy in 2050. And then the question is what are the issues in my country? First is the influence of legal cases. As the Supreme Court has said that the government has to do more in reducing CO2 emissions. And the Council of States said the Dutch government should do more to fulfill the promises regarding nitrogen reduction schemes. So it's important that the legal element will increase. And you can see that development, I think, also in other countries. The second element in that is energy. You probably know we are a gas producing country, but the government decided that they will stop with producing gas in northern part of the country in 2030, but we will do it already next year. So we are in an age of transition. So we talk about the solar panels, the wind energy. In the North Sea, you will find a lot of uh, offshore windmill parks. That is what's happening. We talk about the nuclear energy. So energy transition is really key on our agenda. And you can see there's a lot of climate action that counts for businesses, universities, NGOs, and cities. The nice thing of the Netherlands is we have a climate agreement and it was really a public-private agreement. The awareness has increased. And now Europe, three remarks as well. It's about the connection between the Green Deal, and uh, it has already been mentioned, uh, proposals of the European Commission to get 
carbon, uh, Europe carbon neutral by 2050. And the recovery and resilience uh, facility, the RF, and that has to do with stimulating European economies because of the corona crisis. The key element now is that we should lay the connection between the Green Deal and this uh, facility. And countries are invited to clarify what they are doing to lay that connection. And 37% of the financial means must be spent on climate action. Energy in Europe is high on the agenda. Uh, people do understand that we have to change things, battery innovation, hydrogen, and we have a sense of discussion on the role of gas in Europe. A third element, it's about honesty in the discussion. Um, there is also greenwashing, so be honest about it. Measure things in the right way. And we need a carbon border adjustment mechanism. It has to do with fair competition that should be in line with sustainability uh, performances. If you talk about SDGs and climate change, this is really a matter of international cooperation. SDG number 17 is partnerships. So we need governments that are really willing to analyze how things are. It's a matter of monitoring what is really happening. And if things are not going right, be aware of it and be critical towards each other. The role of the business sector is really very, very important. And we have the UN Global Compact, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the World Economic Forum. We have cooperation between cities and universities. We are uh, living in a world, we talk about uh, the ESG, you know, the criteria for uh, uh, asset management, environment, social and governments, but unify those criteria and be honest about the results. I think this is really key. And we need correcting mechanisms. So we have to do our utmost to do the right things. That's the reason why we talk in Europe about the carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism and learn from each other. Um, last year, I had a meeting with your Prime Minister, Prime Minister Lee, in February, when we were allowed to travel, and we had a great discussion about sustainability. We really can learn from each other. Two weeks ago, I had a meeting with high-ranked CEOs and the Minister of Environment in Japan. Really, we can learn from each other. This is a really two-way traffic. It's good to underline that. And then we have to be honest. There are some burning climate change issues. We have to phase out the subsidies for fossil fuels. It is important to talk about the poor countries and the poor people in the world because they can suffer. We have to be aware of that. And it's a matter of having a new mindset. It's about creativity, innovation, disruptive changes. So it is a matter of rethinking, redesigning, and reinventing. And who should uh, uh, lead the change? This is really a matter for all of us. I remember Ban Ki-moon very well the former Secretary General of the United Nations, he said, we will never reach the SDGs without the private sector. So it's a matter of and governments and businesses and cities and NGOs, we need them all. And I see beautiful examples in my own country, for example, all the universal applied sciences, they said, we will integrate the SDGs into our curricula. We have networks of universities in Europe. You see beautiful examples of businesses working together all over the world. And as Neo, you referred to the Dutch Stimul Growth Coalition, coalition of eight multinationals. We said, let's work together with others. I think this is really, really key. So we have to change uh, things, and it is possible. Talk about stakeholder capitalism. The, it has been discussed uh, during the last World Economic Forum session. I think it's really, really important. And who should pay for it? I think uh, the, my remark is, don't lay the burden on future generations. We have to invest now for tomorrow. We have to do it now. We have to be very concrete and specific. Uh, I have a group of young people in the Netherlands that you should pay the true price for a product or service and do not keep out the cost for environmental issues. Be honest uh, about it. You can take the right tax measures and uh, also you can use subsidies. It's so important that we are debunking the long hold beliefs. Sometimes there's a kind of denial of the role of human beings regarding environmental change. Yes, this is the responsibility of people. The other element is sometimes about the other. If others are waiting, I cannot act. No, no, you should act by yourself. I think this is very important. And we should stop financial short-termism. It's about long-term thinking, as uh, Dr. Kaur said uh, so, uh, a few minutes ago. It's about long-term thinking, and it's about the right balance between the economy and society. This is all about our common future. We need a global uh, agenda and climate action is part of that. I want to thank Temasek very, very much for organizing this uh, event. And I must say, it's always good to be uh, with people of Singapore. Uh, the people who know me denote, <laughs> denote better. I really love Singapore. So I'm honored to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. and Peter. And we definitely look forward to welcoming you to Singapore soon. Um, 
and everyone else on uh, this panel, uh, we are looking forward uh, to when the travel restrictions can be lifted. Thank you. Next, Dr. Andrew Steer, uh, President and CEO of the World Resources Institute, is also one of the most influential think tanks on sustainability climate issues globally. Uh, Dr. Andrew uh, has been in the news of late because he's soon leaving uh, WRI uh, to take on the role as president and CEO of the Bezos Earth Fund. Uh, and we would naturally have many questions on your priorities uh, going forward. Uh, but for today, right, uh, I, I know that WRI has the stories to watch that you actually talk about on an annual basis. And I'm very interested to hear uh, your on the stories to watch in sustainability and climate change for 2021 and beyond. And where do you see momentum? And what more do you feel is needed uh, for us to get to net zero? Dr. Stier. Well, thank you again, Wei, and uh, distinguished ministers, ladies, gentlemen, friends. Uh, what a great pleasure it is to be here. What a terrific conversation already. Congratulations to Masek for uh, for, for doing this. Uh, and congratulations to the government of, of Singapore, uh, Minister Kaur, Minister Lee, um, your five points are exactly right. And starting with city nature is brilliant because solutions are gonna be found in cities and we have to change not only economies of cities, but we have to change the psychology of cities and bringing nature into cities the way Singapore is doing so brilliantly is actually a model for the whole world. So I'd like to congratulate you. Coming back to the earlier question, uh, is there a middle way to solve the problem of climate change? Um, I wish there were, uh, but it's, it's more exciting than that. Uh, we've got a big task to do. Scientists tell us that we need to be uh, neutral in carbon emissions by the middle of the century. Net zero, as we call it. That requires that this decade, the 2020s, we need to halve carbon emissions. The next decade, the 2030s, we need to halve them again. And in the 2040s, we need to halve them again. There is no middle way to get there. This is an exciting revolution ahead of us. Um, and the good news is that, um, that we're seeing incredible um, ideas, incredible leadership right now. You know, 29 years ago, um, I was at the original Rio Earth Summit. And I think Pat Sawano, you were probably there as well. Um, and at that Earth Summit in 1992, I watched as world leaders walked up one by one and they signed the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And there was a real sense actually of moral purpose. These were leaders who were determined to solve the problem. Now, unfortunately, they didn't. <laughs> and for 25 years, we actually didn't have very much leadership. We had bright sparks. I mean, uh, Prime Minister Balkanendi was one, Pat Sawono, you were doing great things in Singapore and Indonesia and so on. So there certainly were bright spots, but it didn't add up. And then in 2015, we had this sort of magical moment where finally world leaders are willing to say, we are going to do it now. And we signed the Paris deal. Now, when we sat in Paris and watched that being signed, we wouldn't have imagined that today there would be a hundred countries that are committed to net zero. And they account for more than 50% of the entire carbon emissions in the world. This is really positive. In addition to that, we now have 1,500 major global corporations committed to net zero. We have 15,000 cities and towns committed to net zero. And even in the financial sector, there now is more, are more than $20 trillion of assets under management committed to, do, to move towards net zero by 2050. This is very, very encouraging. Now, as uh, Prime Minister Balkanendi and Pat Sawono both said, it's great to have long-term views, great to have long-term commitments. What we now need to do is to bring this down to earth and say, what is your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? How are we going to get that halving of carbon emissions this decade? And that's what the so-called NDCs are, which is the uh, nationally determined contributions that you have to do under the Paris deal. Now, so far, there are about 80 of those that have come in for the next round. And this is a very important year because all countries need to now up their game on their NDCs. And at the World Resources Institute, we analyze all of them. And of those 80, about half of them are really quite good. But half of them, quite frankly, are not very ambitious. 
Now, what do we need and why are we seeing progress now, at least in half the world? <laughs> um, leadership. Leadership from young people deserves huge credit. We've never seen the passion that exists. That's had huge impact in Europe and the United States and increasingly in Asia as well. We've seen amazing leadership from the uh, technological sector. We've seen costs come down much greater than we thought, not only in renewable energy, but actually in the hydrogen economy and in battery storage and so on. So that's very exciting as well. We've also seen amazing leadership from the economics profession and from the business sector. There has been an intellectual revolution over the last five years, literally. We used to believe that if you addressed climate change aggressively, it would be a nice thing to do, but it would hurt your economy. You would lose jobs. You would lose competitiveness. We now know that that is actually the economics of the last century. The economics of this century is much more dynamic. It points out that if you take strong action on climate change, not only will you stop bad things happening, but you will start good things happening quickly. You'll become more efficient because you'll use energy more efficiently. You will drive new technology. And there's an entire field of economics now on induced technological change. And you will reduce risk. And if you reduce risk and you improve technology and you improve efficiency, those three things combined lead to a short-term gain in productivity. And as Pa Sawono knows, Indonesia has just done an amazing piece of work over the last two years looking at the new climate economy for Indonesia. And they show that if Indonesia actually acts strongly, you don't have to wait 10 years for better growth. Growth starts straight away because you're lowering risk, you're giving signposts to the private sector. So there's been a revolution in the way we think about this, and that is incredibly important. Now, just back to sort of national leadership for a moment. Um, we have seen uh, in both Europe and in the United States um, and increasingly in other countries around the world, leaders willing to say, actually, we are willing to take bold measures. Consider the United States. I mean, we've gone from a situation, and I'm in Washington, D.C. right now, gone from a situation where we had a president who went to work every Monday morning trying to undermine anything that we were trying to do on climate change. He actively tried to prevent action on climate change. We now have a president who's put together an amazing team. And he, on the 22nd of April, will come out with a plan. We don't know what it will be, but I'll bet you it'll be around 50%. A 50% reduction in emissions this decade from the United States. And that matches the 55% that the European Union has come up with and the 65% that the United Kingdom has come up with. Now, the question is, why are they doing this? I mean, this is crazy. Surely it's going to cost their economy. No, it's not, actually. It's going to make their economy better. Why should we have 96% of all the electric buses in China, for example? Why should individual countries that have got ahead of the curve, like China, why should they have all the export markets? Why should they not, in the United States, be a, a, a vibrant industry for renewable energy and so on? So, so these are exciting times. You know, um, now, one of the things that's interesting is that leaders tend to say, well, I'm not sure exactly how I will get there. Last night, I had a, a call with an environment minister from a major Asian country. And, and he said, look, we'd love to be more ambitious, but I don't know exactly how I could do this by 2030. And I said to him, well, actually, when President Kennedy said, we are going to send a man to the moon and bring him back safely by the end of this decade, he actually didn't know exactly how he was gonna get there. But he set a vision and human beings are able to set visions and leadership is precisely stepping into that unknown, which is incredibly exciting. And what we do know is that citizens will be better off if we're more ambitious. We'll have a cleaner, greener, healthier future. So uh, it's an honor to be here. I'd love to also, if you have any questions on the Basos Earth Fund, another example of leadership, by the way. So a very, very wealthy man. He said, I think this is the decisive decade for climate change. So I'm going to put $10 billion, billion with a B, and I'm not going to have it dispersed over the next 100 years. It will be spent down this decade. Why? Because this is the decisive decade. 
And so that's what I'm going to be switching to. Let me just say that the World Resources Institute, it loves working with Temasac and with Singapore. We learn so much from you, and it's a great honor to be your partner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, for your very kind words. Uh, we'll now move on very quickly to uh, Dr. Ma Jin, uh, Chairman of the Green Finance Committee uh, for the China Society for Finance and Banking. He also wears many other hats, I know that, uh, also Director of Research uh, for Green Finance at Tsinghua University. Dr. Ma, China has recently proclaimed to achieve net zero by 2050. And this is very bold. I mean, to Andrew's earlier comment around uh, bold commitments, given that China today accounts for one third of global emissions. And to achieve this bold vision, uh, we envisage that this will require very bold policies, bold action, and a lot of imagination and innovation. Can you give us a glimpse of the changes that lie ahead? How, how is China thinking about climate change? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Temasek for hosting this uh, very interesting conversation. And it's really my honor and pleasure to be part of this. Uh, on your question on carbon neutrality, as you know that uh, our president uh, announced the uh, target in September last year. And in the last uh, five, six months, I think the number of conversation on carbon neutrality has skyrocketed. I'll just tell you that uh, during these weeks, I'm invited to more than 10 meetings every week on carbon neutrality. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, that's the uh, enthusiasm that we are seeing uh, in China from every key ministry, from every uh, province, uh, all the major cities, uh, they're all working on roadmap on carbon neutrality. For example, um, we are now part of actually conversation in the energy sector, transportation, building, and uh, the forestry sector. Um, all of them are going to do their part. And uh, one of the uh, projection from a friend of mine uh, who is the uh, head of the Energy Institute in Tsinghua University. Uh, he is actually part of the uh, Xie Zhenghua's team um, that delivered the, uh, uh, the overall uh, sort of a roadmap for energy um, transition. And he said that China uh, will achieve uh, roughly 95% renewable for um, its uh, electricity uh, by 2045, uh, which is really within 25 years. And uh, this is because uh, the energy sector needs to achieve net zero 10 to 15 years before the whole country achieving net zero. Uh, that's a very ambitious uh, uh, projection, but I do see it's uh, actually quite feasible uh, because we are now working in the financial sector. We're telling the, uh, uh, the finances, the banks and the investors that uh, if you continue to invest in high carbon energy, you end up with a lot of bad loans and end up with a, a massive reduction of valuation of your investments. So this kind of expectation uh, driven um, action, I think it can accelerate the pace of energy transition uh, in an unexpected way. Um, of course, many other sectors are um, having their plans. Uh, for example, I was part of the conversation this morning uh, with a committee on net zero buildings. Uh, so this uh, uh, committee is now producing standards on what is net zero building. And uh, I was telling them that uh, you need to have a standards for the developers, for designers, but also for the green finance sector, because the financial guys will need to understand what is net zero, and uh, then they can provide financing uh, for the green buildings and for retrofit. So all these activities are going uh, on. Of course, we will uh, see the specific roadmap for each sector um, in, in the near future. Uh, but just to give you a sense of the amount of investment that we're estimating uh, for the carbon neutrality, I think anywhere between 100 trillion to 500 trillion RMB will be needed um, for carbon neutrality in the coming 30 years in China. This is much higher than early estimates of uh, green investment. In fact, uh, Andrew uh, was a uh, part of our conversation back five, six years ago uh, when you helped us in estimating the uh, uh, green investment demand. Uh, that time we didn't have much on the carbon neutrality, but now with carbon neutrality, it will lift the uh, demand for uh, low carbon investment uh, uh, hugely. And, uh, and then it brings uh, uh, the topic of how do we really finance this 100 to 500 trillion uh, green investments. And uh, the financial community uh, led by the central bank, namely PBOC, is working on a set of a new green finance guidelines. Um, you probably know that we had a green finance guideline five years ago, but we're now revising these guidelines and policies around carbon neutrality. 
by improving the taxonomy to make it more consistent with uh, um, net zero and enhancing disclosure requirements, uh, making sure that the corporates, financial institutions will disclose climate and carbon related information and putting in stronger incentive, uh, which in my view should include a much bigger relanding facility from the central bank to offer low cost financing for large scale uh, investments in the low uh, carbon sector and also a range of products uh, which are encouraging uh, low carbon activities, for example, um, carbon footprint related or linked financial products so that uh, uh, by offering these products, they can incentivize the companies to lower their carbon emission every day. Um, so all these are efforts we're making uh, domestically, but also I think it's very important to collaborate uh, on the international uh, side. Um, that's why um, we are very involved in many international platforms, including in the relaunch of the G20 Sustainable Finance Study Group this year uh, by the Italian uh, government, who is the, uh, the presidency of G20 this year. And the just last few days, um, the uh, central bank governor and finance minister of G20 decided to upgrade uh, this relaunched Sustainable Finance Study Group to a working group. And I have an honor to be the co-chair representing China, working with our U.S. co-chair from the U.S. Treasury. So um, uh, this is going to be the platform I think it will help uh, uh, develop a roadmap for the G20 for the coming few years on sustainable finance and guide uh, some of the uh, work at the international level. But beyond that, uh, we're also working actively with IPSF, uh, namely the International Platform for Sustainable Finance, to uh, drive harmonization of sustainable finance standards and also uh, working closely with the NGFS, that's the uh, Central Bank Center Supervisor Network for greening the financial system. Um, I personally was the head of the supervision work stream back a couple of years ago, and now I'm leading the work on research work stream under the NGFS, which is now working on biodiversity and finance. And uh, uh, by middle of this year, we probably will publish a short version on how the uh, loss of biodiversity will affect the financial stability. And by end of this year, uh, namely at the COP, uh, we should have a uh, more complete version of the view uh, to guide the financial sector to think about uh, the need to protect the biodiversity and, and uh, to consider the loss of biodiversity's impact on itself. Back to you, Ginghui. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Martin. Last but not least, uh, we have um, Ms. Irina Vitell, Corporate Advisor for Tomasek uh, and also a former partner in McKinsey. Uh, Irina has a very keen interest in inclusive urban development and I think this is an area that is critical uh, when we talk about sustainability and also sustainable rural growth. Right, uh, I know your advisor also to many large corporates uh, and have a good pulse on how the business world is thinking about these issues. In fact, uh, one of the more interesting, uh, most interesting work that um, Irina did in McKinsey was to publish a, a, a research uh, on how half the world shops. And this was one of the most path breaking uh, uh, studies around the consumption patterns of the growing middle income groups in countries such as India. So Irina, I'm very interested to hear more about how the corporates, the growing middle income groups are thinking about sustainability and climate change. Right, uh, can we uh, and how can we actually mobilize them for action? Irina, to I, over to you. I think the India story is an interesting one because at two thousand dollars per capita income, um, one could almost say that the contribution, the negative contribution of Indians to climate change is ahead of us because as incomes grow, people will uh, ruin the planet a bit more, ruin under inverted commas. But India is thinking about climate change and perhaps its biggest contribution or commitment now has been on renewable energy. And yet I wonder if there might be a slightly different approach needed for countries like India, given their stage of development. And let me tell you why I think so. You guys know better than me that while one can commit to renewable energy and India really has to build out her electricity uh, capacity, a lot of this actually requires energy efficiency from communities, from people, and there's no silver bullet there. Or if you take the example of cities, here's one of the least urban countries in the world, 
with only about 30% of her people living in cities, which means almost 400 million Indians are going to move to cities in the next 20 years. And we already have 6,900 towns. If you look at these towns, they collectively need about $3 trillion of investment to rebuild. And there is an opportunity here to rebuild them green. There's an opportunity here to design um, transportation systems which are more sensible. There's an opportunity here to use new ways of building new cities. But all of that requires capacity, capacity of town planners, incentives for infrastructure companies, um, even metrics that cities use to assess themselves. And those are not always easy to do in countries such as India, which perhaps have 100 the number of planners that they actually need. And so there is perhaps an opportunity here to fix the cities and leapfrog and build green cities. But there's also a possibility that one might miss this in the absence of capacity, both people as well as resources. Or if you take Indian agriculture, 50% of India's people are still employed in agriculture. And agriculture is part of climate change for two reasons. There is a lot of methane contribution from almost 120 million milch animals. But more importantly, um, there is huge amounts of water usage. 86% of India's water uh, is consumed in agriculture. And if you look at this mix of people who are employed in agriculture, um, there are about 146 million operational landholders. 86% of them are small, less than two hectares. Only 40% of them are irrigated. Only 60% of them have good soil. And if you look at a country that sits at the base of the Himalayas, that has to renegotiate its water treaty, both with China and with Pakistan, and that is thinking of groundwater recharge as a huge issue. If you think of the impact on these farmers from variations in temperature, from the way we're seeing rains come in the form of downpours and the number of days with no water increasing, we're seeing 50% of India's employed people putting anywhere between 15 and 20% of their income at risk. And so I often wonder, what does it take a large country like India, which is such an important part of the climate change effort of humanity, but has the challenge of growing of growing at 8 to 10% to keep her people aspirations happy, to create jobs and employment for 20 million people who are joining the labor force every year. What does it take that government, that society, that economy to be able to balance focusing on the here and now, on the emergency created sometimes by COVID, sometimes by the absence of monsoon, sometimes by a financial crisis, what is right to do, which is saving the planet and saving humanity. And I wonder if we need to think collectively about a different approach. For, so, for example, should we change the metrics by which we reward countries? Um, India, like most Asian countries, is about shame and glory. Until such time that we measure success of politicians and of companies as pure GDP and GDP growth, how can a depreciated GDP, which is what the real cost of climate change is, be an important area of focus? Should we be looking at metrics that we all reward ourselves for, politicians for, and companies for? Second, should these not be just discussions, but missions? If you look at India, India is actually very good at missions. We eradicated polio. <laughs> we did a very good job with AIDS. We're doing a reasonable job with COVID. We have a problem with something that is continuous. Could this be a mission? And I remember what Eisenhower said, that when a problem is complex, make it bigger. Could this be a mission across countries where we jointly sign up to save humanity? If you look at India's biggest cities, uh, Bombay, um, Chennai, Calcutta, all of them are coastal cities. And they are amongst the top 10 cities at risk by 2050. They have to build dikes between 20 centimeters, and in the case of Calcutta, 60 centimeters to just survive. Orissa, one of our state, has lost 28% of her coastal land because of water increase. Now, will this be handled on a day-to-day -day basis or do we need a global mission across many cities which are at the coastal level? And third, do we need to support these conversations and these targets with the right resources, not just of money and of deep investment, because we're seeing that happen, but also capacity. 
because the real challenge in countries like India is not uh, the knowledge that we need to do it, not even the how or so it's not the why and it's the how, it is the when and who. And so let me pause here and say, I think India is having great discussions. If we want the discussions to move to plans that will save the planet, I really think collectively, not just for India, but for many countries, we need to revisit what we hold each other accountable for as metrics. We need to support English with math of capacity and money. And we really need to think about a collective commitment where we hold each other accountable through global um, competitive missions. Let me pause here. Thank you, Irina. That was a very interesting insight. Um, I would now like to uh, dive straight into uh, the Q&A session because uh, there are many questions coming in uh, from the participants. Um, first question, uh, and it's addressed to Park Sawano, right? Uh, and I also like to invite the other panelists to also share your views. Um, it's with re regards to finance. Uh, and the question reads, uh, to transition towards a green economy, uh, one of the key success factors will be to have the financial sector throw its uh, full weight behind uh, the efforts. And with the e e economic stimulus program uh, by the Indonesian government, uh, there is actually momentum for this transition. How do we facilitate uh, further collaboration amongst the finance, government, private and grassroots sectors to drive uh, the ambition forward? Pak It's actually happening. In Indonesia, as uh, Minister Siti Nurbaya ex explained uh, in her speech, uh, clean up. And then uh, I think the idea is to, again, yeah, to remake the architecture of our institutions and regulations. And in that sense, uh, these uh, financial uh, systems that we're setting up will have to be uh, implemented you know, uh, at a fast clip. Yeah. Uh, we cannot afford to wait any longer. Uh, I think uh, I'd have to stop at that because um, I know that uh, there are friends in the audience who are more um, articulate and knowledgeable in the field of climate finance and maybe uh, but, uh, it would be best for them to have a chance to chip in in the dialogue tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The, would any of the panelists like to comment? Uh, yes, Dr. Marcin. Can I say a few words? Yes. Yeah, I think the question uh, is really about how private sector money can be involved in financing uh, green and low carbon activities. Uh, if you only rely on government, I think we can only do one tenth of the job and 90% of the financing uh, for achieving carbon neutrality, for protecting the environment, uh, for biodiversity, we have to come from private sector. Uh, that's why a few key elements are very important to, to mobilize private sector money. One is taxonomy. You need to define what uh, activity is green, uh, that qualified green finance. And uh, secondly, you need to uh, have a disclosure requirement, which means that the, uh, the issuers or borrowers uh, we need to tell the market, um, including the capital markets and the lenders and investors, that uh, my investments can generate environmental benefits. For example, how many tons of CO2 I can reduce, how many tons of uh, uh, NOx and the SOx I can reduce, uh, how much wastewater I can reduce. Um, <clears throat> that's a disclosure piece. And the third thing is uh, uh, for some projects which do have environmental and climate benefits, but they are not profitable enough, they need some incentive from the government in terms of subsidies or tax uh, exemption from the regulators in terms of a risk of weights adjustment and uh, maybe uh, from the environmental uh, regulators as well uh, to allow them to have uh, special access to certain uh, products uh, and markets. So these are what I call incentive that's needed for a certain period of time to incubate these projects and make them more profitable than otherwise. And finally, uh, the financial sector needs to be very innovative in uh, tailor-making products to meet the demand for various uh, uh, green finance projects. Some require long-term financing, some require short-term financing, 
some require financing that can uh, tolerate risks, and some need uh, insurance products. That's why we need a suite of financial products to meet the demand of uh, the green economy. Prof. Yen Peter, you wanted to make a comment as well? Yeah, but also Andrew, <laughs> um, yes. uh, I, I, I think the Dr. Mayon, uh, Mayon makes very important remarks about the financial sector. Let me make a comparison uh, with what happened in my country. In 1953, we had a terrible water flood. Uh, 1,800 people died because of the water flood. People discovered in those days we've waited too long to keep our dikes intact. And that led to a new, complete new investment schemes. And let me make a comparison with the world in which we're living now. It's a matter of doing the right investments. And therefore, I'm happy in Europe that in any case, there is a connection between the Green Deal and the financial means to stimulate European economies. I think this is really key. That's one. The second point, uh, Dr. McGillan spoke about the financial sector. I fully agree with your remarks about the necessity of innovation in the financial sector. But uh, let's be honest, if we are, let's say, taking into account the way of measurement of, of banks, for example, insurance companies, usually it's about what are the quarterly results? What are about the profits? What about the cost-saving measures? I think it would be better if we, have, if we would have a better balance between the financial performance and the societal performance. That was the reason why I said so important that you have the ESG criteria. Uh, you should unify on those criteria and you should measure them in a better, better way. I think this is really, really key. So I, I'm fully in line with those remarks that say that we have to change things. We have to invest. We have to improve our metrics uh, tools. Uh, I really make uh, these remarks. And if we are able to be enough in that way, that can really make the change. So therefore, I'm in line with what uh, Dr. Bion has said. Dr. Andrew? Well, just to agree fully with what both Marjun and uh, Prime Minister Balkanendi said, and indeed Marjun is probably at the very center of this issue globally, so we should listen to, we should listen to him. Financial markets actually are, are um, in moving in the right direction quicker than we thought. And there's two reasons. One, uh, financial markets are supposed to worry about risk, and increasingly, obviously, climate risk is a big issue. Second, financial markets are supposed to put money where the rates of return are higher. Until recently, we always assumed that if you put your money into sustainable businesses, that would be nice to do, but you would lose some of your yield. We now know, actually, that if you want uh, the best 10-year return, put your money in companies that have high ESG. So we're seeing this really encouraging trend. But as, as Majun and um, uh, Jan Peter said, um, we need to have a linkage between public and private finance. One of the exciting things is, and, and, uh, is the development of the coalition of finance ministers for climate. And two days ago, as part of the World Bank spring meetings, they had 60 finance ministers gathering to talk about climate change. And the new chair of that is um, Minister of Finance Sri Mulyani Indrawati from, uh, from Indonesia. And it was really cool to hear her. And then you've got these leaders from all around the world talking about how can we as finance ministers, how can we use this stimulus package $14 trillion is being pumped into the world economy right now over the next two years. How can we use this to invest in tomorrow's economy and also do the kind of things that Marjun was talking about? How do, we, how do we incentivize the really big money, which is going to be the private sector? So these are really exciting days. Thank you. I want to move on now to talk about the role of civil society. And this is a question uh, for Dr. Marjun, but also uh, invite uh, Dr. Amy Kaur, uh, Irina, uh, who have been very active uh, with, with, the, with the grassroots uh, to also share their views. And the question reads, uh, for long-term success and sustainability, public acceptance and conviction will be critical. Would you be able to elaborate on the role of NGOs and civil society in these efforts? Well, if I may kick off, uh, uh, I'm running a couple of um, well, I'm not sure what we call NGOs, but these are sort of industrial associations and platforms. Uh, for example, the Green Finance Committee that I'm running uh, in China, we organize 250 large members. Most of them are um, big banks and investment companies and so on to uh, innovate uh, in the space of uh, green finance. So it's really building a bridge between the government, the regulators and uh, uh, the financial market if the government comes up with a guideline saying, uh, let's do 25 things, who is going to do that? Who is going to offer the capacity building? Who is going to channel the information? And, uh, and that's 
um, industrial sort of associations job. And uh, I think we do create a very strong linkage between the government and the sector. Um, the example is the green investment principles for the Better Road, uh, which we uh, named the China Green Finance Committee and City of London launched back uh, uh, about two and a half years ago. And we now organize 39 large organizations, including 36 biggest financial firms in the world, um, to make commitments uh, to invest more in green and low carbon activity in the developing world. And uh, this is the kind of platform uh, where we can offer uh, um, capacity building on, um, for example, environmental risk analysis on um, disclosure and on uh, um, product innovation, um, which indeed is not something the government can easily do uh, because uh, these banks do not necessarily listen to, uh, to the government. But they actually do listen to a platform we organize. Uh, that's effectiveness of sort of bridge um, uh, in, in the semi-government world. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amy, do, would you like to comment? Sure. Well, I, I basically, I think um, for climate action, really, we need everybody on board, all hands on deck. Um, as I've said earlier, you know, we need to look at um, collaboration, collaboration at every level, whether it's uh, local, regional or international. And uh, with all, you know, individuals as well as businesses and civil society, NGOs. So uh, a very recent example will be, for instance, our Singapore Green Plan uh, 2030, which we talk about, we say it's a national blueprint uh, and it is a living document. And it is not just about government uh, making uh, policy decisions, you know, uh, putting in place regulatory measures, but also um, all other stakeholders, including NGOs coming on board uh, to help us achieve uh, the various goals in the five pillars, you know, which uh, uh, Professor Ian talked about earlier. Uh, and indeed, what we are doing is uh, we're going to organize conversations around the Singapore Green Plan and invite stakeholders, including civil societies, to come on board and um, run with some of these programs and ideas that they may come up with for each of or you know some of these pillars. Uh, what we call alliances for action, for instance. Um, so one good example, of course, is City in Nature. We have lots of green groups uh, who are really very passionate about the environment, about nature, about nature-based solutions. And they give very good uh, input and ideas as well as, you know, because they are so passionate, they champion uh, uh, these projects. We also have, for instance, um, youth groups, NGOs who are really passionate about the plastic issue. And uh, the ministry worked with them very closely uh, to champion um, you know, reducing um, consumption of these um, uh, disposables, for instance. Uh, and indeed, you know, actually many times, very often, our NGOs are able to influence individuals and then influence businesses because businesses will react to consumer demands. Yeah, and then they will also uh, adopt sustainability uh, um, policies and, and uh, objectives. So, so I think we need to work at every level, and that's what we do. We have what we call citizens' work group also, that we have actually uh, set up, uh, work together with the government to co-develop um, uh, and co-deliver ideas. Uh, and indeed, um, tomorrow I'm chairing um, and making a response to a recommendations from our citizens work group, uh, individuals as well as people from NGOs about um, how we can reduce excessive consumption of disposables. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Irina, and then uh, well, Prof. Yen. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think everybody has a voice because in many ways, choices each one of us has made um, deliberately or not deliberately has brought us to the situation that we are in as a humanity. And I see three roles for society more broadly and civil society as ways of collecting these voices. The first one is um, pressure. Pressure on our generation by the younger generation or by consumers on large companies. That's the best way of getting people to react. The second one is holding people accountable. 
the whole conversation that's happening on uh, risk-adjusted returns for the financial sector or what we see uh, hedge fund chairman write about su supporting or not supporting carbon financing. I think a lot of this is accountability that society is holding um, their financial sector for starters with and then more broadly. But the third one is also changing social norms and sharing risks. For example, if you think of uh, living with the implication of climate change, because we're talking about um, making sure the Paris Agreement gets impacted, but the poorest amongst us are already living with the, the cost of this. And a lot of it comes from changing community behavior and changing social norms. If you look at water, for example, in India, we now have millions of water user association in small, um, in small villages, uh, villages with populations of 1,000 or 5,000 across castes. And India, as you know, has many castes, but people are having conversations on um, groundwater not, depend, not belonging only to the farmer who owns the land, but being co a common property. They're talking about usage of water. They're talking of upstream and downstream movement of water. Unheard of um, stuff that we couldn't have thought of 10 years ago, but these people, even without perhaps using words like climate change, will tell you things are not what they were in our parents' generation and in our grandparents' generation. And they are living with the implication of changes to climate. And unless they get a voice and unless they change social norms and share risks with each other, um, whatever we do to mitigate is still going to create immeasurable misery to millions and millions of people. And so to me, Society, civil society is part of the solution, even as we run really fast to prevent the temperature from rising. But, you know, it is here and now, and it's only each one of us that can, that can support each other and do less harm in the years to come. Thank you. Prof. Peter? Yeah, uh, I like this question very much. My, my PhD thesis was about government regulation and civil society organization. So if you talk about NGOs, I like that. And it's my conviction that in societies, you always must have the right balance between government, market, and civil society. And that is, in fact, maybe the background of, of this question. And now something remarkable is happening in, in this time. When we talk about the sustainable development goals, this is really a matter for and public and private. And we need partnerships. That's one. I referred already to the wording stakeholder capitalism. That means that uh, an economy should serve and the shareholders and the clients uh, and the employees and society at large. So it's a new view on the way how you organize economies. And the third element has to do with which type of business models do we have? And this is not the traditional Anglo-Saxon model of making profit in the short run. No, it's much more about creating shared value. And these uh, discussions are in fact in line. And therefore, uh, issues like stakeholder dialogue are extremely important. Let me give an example. Unilever, uh, I, I know the CEO very well. They have, a, I think, a very good sustainability policy, but they are always investing in stakeholder dialogues just to learn from others. And you need also critical voices. Are we doing things in the right way? Are, therefore, you, you must uh, have this type of discussion. So I would like to underline the importance of the civil society when we talk about the future. Last remark, uh, sometimes there is a risk that we talk in terms of what are the costs, uh, what are the negative elements or whatever the cost of climate change, but it's also good to underline it's the matter of new economic opportunities. If you would talk of Ellen MacArthur, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, she is really convinced that the circular economy has huge economic benefits. So it's also good to have a positive mindset. And let's say it's good to have a connection between, let's say, the positive mindset and the uh, uh, involvement of the civil society. Thank you. Um, I want to now move on to talk about food and agriculture, right, uh, which is one of the key uh, emitters. And uh, Pat Sohon, this question is actually for you, but again, I will invite the other panelists to, to chime in. And the question reads, is it possible to find a middle cost? So the, 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 uh, uh, the person asking the question is using your term again. Is it possible to find a middle cost to address the global unsustainable food systems? Mm -hmm. so that we can strike a better balance between business as usual, which is extensive agriculture, food imports, and a more locally based approach, mm -hmm. such as bioregionalism. And really the, the word bioregionalism is new to me, 
basically means how human activity needs to take into account or be constrained by ecological or geographical boundaries. Um, thank you, Gimhai. Well, uh, I've been known in Indonesia for uh, some time as somebody who nags everybody about food, energy, and water in relation to climate change. Um, it's an interesting situation in Indonesia because you have two streams working on food. One is the uh, agriculture industry, which operates uh, according to the legacy of the uh, Green Revolution in the uh, 80s of last century. And at the same time, we have these new players practicing um, local power, for instance, practicing um, circular economy, practicing urban farming. Yeah. And we have one of them, I think, uh, in this room, uh, Mushab Nur Santio, who is uh, only 26 years old and has opened many eyes that uh, there is an alternative to food production. Now, the, the big picture is this. I think these new entities, because they do not carry baggages of the past, they will have a very good chance, not only of surviving, but also of flourishing. Whilst the big corporates in agriculture and other ventures as well, they may want to change, but they don't know what to do with the baggage of the past. On balance, I think the new players will win. And then the old players would have to sort out the problems that they're facing. Yeah? And they'll be facing disruptions. They'll be facing a lot of uh, things. Yeah? Uh, many of them they never expect to experience before. The same in the financial world, I think. Um, the new uh, financial schemes being worked out yeah, uh, have a, every good chance to succeed, again, because they carry no baggage of the past. Now, what's so urgent about food, energy, and water? Because these three commodities are essential, vital, and very basic to the existence of human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Irina, I know agriculture is also something that's very dear to you. Would you like to comment? I totally agree with um, what we just heard, that there, there is a need for a new approach. Uh, and I think there is also a need to revisit the paradigm of food as got developed largely in the West um, after the Second World War. And I sometimes think if you look at what you see in China and what you definitely see in India, where two big trends, uh, one of them is real, the other one is because of economy. Um, you see a lot of, maybe because of the fact that India has so many climate um, types during the year, we see a lot more of fresh uh, it also helps that only 20% of Indian women work. And so one of their important roles is to provide fresh food for the family. But there is a whole question on processing. There's a whole question on extensive value addition. Uh, a lot of it driven by changes in roles of, uh, in society, but also because of the evolution of the retail industry and because of the trade-off between labor and cost. And it's, it's worth thinking whether, because of COVID accelerated, but more underlined, will be a return to healthier, fresher, uh, better food, which will change some of the dynamic. And the other one is the balance between meat and, and vegetable. Um, in India, a lot of it is because of uh, the economy. Let me tell you very bluntly, right? I mean, 60% of Indians are non-vegetarian, perhaps 70% would be or 80% would be. But uh, there is an increasing question about the cost of that. And you see new forms of protein emerge. And I know some of the largest food companies in the world, in addition to attackers, 
are looking at new forms of protein. So it will be interesting to see the future of food and it might come as much from climate change reasons as it might come from a desire to have more control on what we eat, more natural and fresh food and to live closer to nature. Maybe I uh, uh, also just share from our perspective. Uh, obviously, we're not an agricultural country, uh, but uh, as has been said, um, you know, uh, Park Sawa know that uh, food, energy, water is existential, right, uh, for our existence. Uh, and we have um, worked very hard uh, towards, um, you know, uh, water resiliency uh, and the this other frontier that we're looking at is really about food security too, right? water security, food security. Even before COVID-19, we were actually working on that. Uh, even though we're a very small country uh, and less than 1% of our land is actually used for agriculture, uh, you might be surprised that we do have some agriculture here. Um, and um, COVID-19 has actually um, accelerated uh, and shown the importance of the need to have some uh, semblance of food security, yeah, buffer because of supply chain disruptions and obviously, you know, uh, climatic um, uh, risk too. Uh, and therefore, we are working uh, on our 30 by 30 goal, which is 30% of our nutritional needs by 2030. That's not too far away. And what we are relying on really is technology. Uh, future of food, uh, alternative foods to research into that, but also more sustainable uh, way of um, producing food, uh, agriculture, right? Uh, we have a um, high-rise um, vegetable farm, I suppose, uh, indoor um, to produce, uh, you know, uh, leafy vegetables. Uh, we are also looking at fish farming, uh, again, uh, urban, right? So it is really about using technology and in a more sustainable way. And I think that even for large countries, because of um, climate change, and um, you, you may also have to look at some of this farming technology, more sustainable as well as climate resilience, right? Indeed. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we've come to the end of the session, but before I close it, I would really like to uh, invite uh, each of the panelists to leave with the audience a thought or an idea around leadership in a sustainability journey. Could I uh, start with uh, Prof. Ian Peter? Thanks. Uh, I think this has been a great discussion. Uh, two remarks. The first is I think that every government business, university, and Joe should ask the question, how can we contribute to the realization of the sustainable development goals? If you ask that question in a fair way and you're willing to act, then you can make the change and this can unite people. So uh, for me, it's realizing SDGs, uh, inspire, innovate, and implement. And my second remark that has to, and that's, uh, I was thinking, why am I always so enthusiastic to participate at Temasek meetings? That has to do with the fact that you are able to bring people together from all over the world. I like this discussion because it's so important that we have the conviction that we, in fact, have to do one common battle. And we, if you want to have a better society, you need uh, the countries all. We have seen during the last years tension between countries, geopolitical conflicts. And the good thing of Tomasek is that you are bringing people from with different backgrounds together. And if you have the right discussion with mutual respect, then you can really make the change. So that's, I want to compliment you for organizing things in this way because we must have a common agenda and common solutions but and also common approaches and common actions and you are contributing to that goal thank you very much thank you dr andrew steer we are now embarked on the most exciting decade in in history just about we are about to see the most amazing revolutions take place the good news is we now have technologies and we know how to do it in a way that actually will make citizens better off. It will it'll create better jobs and so on. Singapore is such an exciting country because it has a role in so many important areas. One, cities are going to be the place where the battle is won or lost. Singapore is the leading city thinking about green issues that needs to be exported. Two, Singapore is a leading player in technology, including remote sensing, including other things which will be transformative. 
Third, Singapore is one of the most important trading entrepots in the world. You sit right in the center of things. Consider the discussion we just had about food. Why are the forests in Southeast Asia being lost? Two words, palm oil. Palm oil is a wonderful crop. Oil palm, we need every single day. It's a good crop. It doesn't need to be grown by cutting down forests. We have the technologies to make sure that doesn't happen. We have the ability during the whole commodity trading system to make sure that's honorable. Singapore, together in relationship with China right now, could really play an unbelievable role. So these are exciting times, and it's been an honor to be with you today. Thank you. Uh, Martin. Thank you. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Andrew that uh, Singapore is a good model for sustainability. Um, but for countries as large as China, we need a lot of models locally. Uh, that's why I think it's a key um, to create models within the country. For example, at the regional level, uh, we have some pilot program for green finance. And uh, now we have a couple of uh, model companies that just declare carbon neutrality for themselves. And uh, we're going to have some uh, regions, uh, either provinces and cities, uh, which will declare carbon neutrality earlier than the national target. I think all these uh, will set a very good example. Uh, they will increase confidence for the rest of the economy uh, for moving ahead. Irina? You know, we are such an interesting race as a human being. Um, when COVID started killing our neighbors, we got together as people and within a year have created more vaccines than any dreamt possible. I wonder if we tangibilize how we are killing the planet, which is what climate change is, and brought the same fervor and mission and created an enemy out of it. I wonder what we would do as a race to solve for it. I really worry that we don't see the invisible enemy and we think it can wait another day when it comes. So my wish is that we declare a war on climate change and make it bigger than COVID and give ourselves one year to find solutions and to make stuff. Thank you. Pap Savono. I'd like to identify three groups which will be the uh, leaders in sustainable journey. One is the new entities that I mentioned uh, just now. The second is the those who repairs the damage done to the environment. And the third is our traditional communities. And this is the third, uh, the third is very interesting because the practitioner, practitioners of uh, traditions may never have heard of climate change. They have no knowledge of the 17 points of SDGs, but they've been doing the right things. Why? Because uh, they inherit the traditional wisdom of, of their ancestors. So these are the three winners in the battle against climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Park. And I give the last word to uh, Dr. Imi Kong. Thank you. Well, first of all, I must thank uh, our panelists, uh, many of you for your very kind words about Singapore. But let me say that, um, you know, as Professor Yen said, collaboration is key uh, to, to work towards a common goal. Uh, and indeed, you know, um, Whilst we are fighting COVID-19, uh, which we call a crisis of a, a generation, uh, climate change hasn't gone away. Uh, and indeed, you know, if we don't act um, soon enough, it, it's a long-term problem and it will be a crisis for many generations. So I think we, like COVID, we need to take collective action, collective global action together uh, to solve, to address the issue. Uh, and to collaborate and share our knowledge and experiences uh, and also support each other in order to be able to address the, this global emergency that we are facing. Be, it, before, you know, irreversible change is um, put upon us, forced upon us and our future generations. Thank you. And on, on behalf of the organizers, thank you to the panelists uh, for 
so generously uh, sharing your time and ideas with us.